Capital Mindset Show, guys. We're your hosts, Austin and Fabio. And today we have an episode for you guys about a stock that we've covered in the past, Fabio. That stock is ASPS. It is a counter cyclical stock by its very nature. It's a counter cyclical business. And Fabio, I kind of want to walk the audience through today some of your thought process behind this because this has been down for quite a while now. Some of your thought process behind this, as well as what this business is, and then also maybe a little bit into position sizing and even speculation. So, before we begin, uh, ASPS is what we consider to be a microcap company. So before we say anything else, we want everyone to know this is my investment, and uh, Austin I think has a position as well. This Small is not, position, yeah. Yes. This is not to uh, hype this stock up. Please do not invest in this. Any investment that you do today or tomorrow or any part in the future it has nothing to do with us because you won't be able to copy our buy price. Okay. So this video will only serve as kind of the, uh, a lesson on the thought process behind it and how it's possible sometimes to see these mistakes in the market and kind of capitalize on them. All right. So going into that. So some of the reasons why I uh, found ASPS to be a very interesting play is because it, as Austin said, it's a counter cyclical business. Basically what that means is when the economy does poorly, this does well. And when the economy does well, this does poorly. So counter cyclical. Right. And so what they basically do is they profit off of uh, mortgages going delinquent. And in that process of the mortgages going delinquent, you have foreclosures. So foreclosures, more foreclosures equals more dollar signs for this company. Right. And everyone likes dollar signs. So um, if we can take a quick look here, uh, I'm going to show everyone basically what the uh, year 2020 had on this business. So you can kind of see here. Um, that they, as the economy was actually getting better and better and better, delinquencies went down and down and down. And then 2020 hit and they weren't allowed to do business. So this was the carryover at some point for whatever was happening at the beginning of the year, but the whole year was just wiped out. And then they weren't uh, able to do any mortgages that were delinquent post uh, this March, 2020. And they're still not until January. What they're allowed to do is only mortgages that were delinquent prior to March of 2020. So we're, I'm waiting on January uh, 2022 for them to actually begin doing uh, or allowed to begin doing their core business again. And more recently, uh, I wanna point out that the stock price has actually been uh, skyrocketing. And the reasoning for this has been because the company just sold a non-core asset for around $150 million. And that's actually right here. Uh, so point, uh, point, point to list, and they're going to uh, uh, get about 70%, 70% of that um, investment, uh, which will equate to around a 900% gain on what they paid for it. And that was some call options that I, I always liked about the business. I knew the business has a lot of different software assets under its name. And the bit, and the more, I took that with a grain of salt because the management was always telling the investors in their presentations that, oh, these software businesses are actually worth a lot if you really compare us to our, our competitors or our peers. And I just took that with a grain of salt. That's not why I was investing. That was just what I consider to be a call option that if they panned out, that'd be great. Uh, but I originally started buying my position uh, around in June. And then this happened when uh, this was an elimination of a key risk. So I, it was a very small position. I'll tell you the majority of my position was purchased here. But right here was uh, one of the largest uh, shareholders is a hedge fund and they offered them a line of credit. And then that eliminated the great fears of bankruptcy. And that's why you saw this run up here. And then over here is when I think I pitched it to uh, Austin, right? So I started yeah, talking. I, I started buying in around like the 824 range and I made it like, cause my, cause my portfolio is small. So I made it like roughly 1% of my total portfolio holdings in this instance. And, and for me in total, I think I, I it was around 1.7% of my capital that I put into this. Uh, now the value is closer to uh, around close, closer to three, just cause it's, mm -hmm. it's done so well, only because it's done so well, not, not because I've added more. Um, and uh, a lot of the, Again, the main thesis was the uh, continuation of the uh, uh, foreclosures, and that would happen in January 2022, as we discussed earlier. Uh, so going into the uh, model real quick, I just want to showcase to the audience what, what it is we're kind of looking at. Now, Altasaurus, the management team, and I'm going to repeat the, the announcement. This is a speculative investment. Um, and please do not follow us into this investment. We are not trying to hype up the stock or anything like that. Uh, quite the opposite. We're just trying to showcase 
uh, for educational purposes, the thought process that went into this. And the reason why it's educational is because if you looked at this from the pure financial aspect or the science aspect, as Austin might say, or I might say as well, is that investing is an art and a science. If you looked at it purely from the science aspect, you would, you would have brushed this company off. It's more like the art aspect that kind of makes you take a second look and say, hmm, there might be something here. So that's what we're trying to highlight here. And again, it might seem obvious now because the mortgage moratorium men did, et cetera. But back then when we were buying it, it wasn't, it wasn't really obvious. It wasn't obvious to the uh, re average retail investors or it wasn't obvious to the market. So again, uh, that remember that bankruptcy risk I talked about, Austin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if I didn't highlight this earlier, the that sales price uh, or that sale of the uh, point list, that's I think they're going to get about between 100 million and 115 million. So if we take a look at their market cap. Um, oh, great. It's not calculating the market cap. <laughs> no, you haven't uh, put in the, the ticker symbol yet. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Would you look at that? Oh, thank and you. Voila. <laughs> so market cap after that price increase is now $226 million. So we're getting now in today's price about a 50-ish percent um, uh, market cap cash injection, which is great. So now I want to play around with some of the growth rates. So let's say, let's assume the buybacks. And I wanted to highlight these buybacks here. So that's what's interesting about this business and why I was highlighting again or making that announcement again that I'm not trying to have a hype up this business. But what's interesting is during these downtimes for them, they've been buying back shares. And that's good, in my opinion, because I want a business to be buying back shares when they're undervalued. Uh, so ideally, since this is a counter cyclical business, what you want to see is the business buy back shares when the economy is doing great, and then doesn't buy back shares when the economy is doing poorly, because that's when they'll do well. And supposedly when their stock price may appreciate significantly above market rates. So the fact that they've been buying back shares during this time is a good sign for me that management team is focused on delivering value to shareholders. And again, this is a very small company. It's, I would consider this a micro cap. But I, I, the reason why we're even talking about this, Austin, if I'm being very fair about it, is our channel is not large enough at all to affect this price. If, if we were a large channel, we would never, that would be against our no. rules. We would never, yeah, no, we but would, we would absolutely never disclose. We're this. taking advantage yeah. for the, for the ones who are here early with us, that this is a great educational video as to like some of these little companies, what you can do with them or what are some things you can spot. Um, again, to be responsible, we, we didn't even, even make a vi Well, we were actually, I don't think we were even filming when we were first buying this company, but, uh, um, yeah, we, we wouldn't, I don't know if we would necessarily talk about it when we were buying it simply because we don't want uh, people to follow in because they don't, we don't know what risk tolerance you have. Yeah. But, and like, especially too, because it's such a small company, yeah. that's another risk in and of itself right there, Fabio. So yes. continue, please continue. <laughs> well, and I want to highlight also what I define as speculative, because when I say the word speculative, and I've said it already in this video, it might be different from your definition of speculative. So for everyone watching, just so you're on the same page as me, what I define as speculative is things that a business or there are risks to the business that are outside of its control. So for example, I also invest in, in, a, in a company, ticker symbol AJRD or Rocketdyne. Uh, I consider that speculative. That one's done really well for me as well. Um, not as well as this one, but it's done well. And I expect it might do well. But the reason why I consider that speculative, while it is a fine business, the bullish thesis is entirely outside of its control. And that would be the acquisition of Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. So because it's outside of its control, it's in the hands of the FTC, I do consider that to be speculative. In this case, it's the federal government issuing uh, moratoriums again. So because that's outside of their uh, control, even though the management is great or the business is doing great, it has to be going to the speculative bucket. All right. So now popping into the model, we have the ticker symbol. It's not a REIT. And we're uh, assuming that we have a market cap of around 226 million. So let's get rid of that for now. So Fabio, mm -hmm. I kind of have a have a question too. You just noted that that, that they have this. Uh, they just sold a portion of, of their business. Now they have this cash position. What do you think that they're going to do with that cash position, Fabio? So that's entirely speculative. I would assume or hope for that they're going to do some sort of capital return to shareholders in the form of buybacks or dividends. Of the two, I'd prefer a dividend simply because mm -hmm. I'd rather take that cash and maybe invest it elsewhere. Uh, because the share price has appreciated so much. I don't want them to, to give it as a buyback. I would have preferred it, obviously, if they did the buyback 
uh, below $10 a share. But now since the share price is at $14 uh, um, or maybe wherever it is on, on when a market opens, I don't want them to uh, buy those shares, even though they still might be technically undervalued depending on what model you use or what assumptions you make. But um, I would prefer the dividend because then that gives me the choice whether or not I want to reinvest that extra cash back into the business or if I want to then go take that cash and invest it elsewhere. And I'm also might be a little biased because the majority of my position in this company is actually uh, split amongst uh, my retirement account. Uh, I do have some in my non retirement account, but enough of it is in my retirement account that my re recognized uh, uh, dividend tax won't be that great. So looking at these growth rate assumptions, I'll explain the 25% in a second, but looking at just the 10%, it, we can see here that the model is telling me it's still a buy. Um, and what, what's going on here is the buyback. The buyback's obviously changing this. If I set or to say no to the buyback, you see it's no longer in the buy range. But for me, I, I can still assume this for me personally because my, buy, my average cost is below $9. My average cost is in the sevens. So it's in the mid to high sevens. So I can still assume this and I can still come out on top with a 20% rate of return over the course of uh, 10 years. Now I want to uh, highlight this extra little calculator that I created just for this company or companies like this, what I call recovery. This is like our recovery calculator. So uh, I wanna highlight that the, they, in 2019, they did around six, $600 million in sales. And this implies a 25% rate of return uh, every year compounded. So the, what this tells me is in year five, right right here in year five, they recovered to around 2019. So I spread out the recovery over the course of five years. And then we can see here what that would be. So it's telling me that that would be the uh, buy range. Now, what's also interesting is uh, that's again, a conservative measure of recovery. What's also interesting is prior to the uh, 2020 situation, they were trading around $20. So I'm assuming a recovery of the business and I'm assuming an intrinsic value of this price. And what happens if, for example, the foreclosures are greater than that in, during the during good time of the economy? So 2019, again, we can agree it was a good time for the economy. Uh, what happens if the, if the foreclosures are greater than that? Well, then we can assume potentially a greater growth rate that they go past the recovery point. And again, the recovery point I'm defining as revenues that were uh, around the point where the or pre 2020, which was around 600. So what happens if the, the foreclosures are greater and they get past that point? Well, I think the management disclosed that um, I think every 1% increase in the delinquency is around 700 million in potential revenues. So that being said, it could pretty if depending on how bad things get, this could this revenue growth could be substantially higher. But I, I'm in the realm of trying to figure out my margin of safety and then Playing around, but again, unfortunately, it still has to be speculative because I have to worry about the federal government coming in and kind of doing something. So uh, that being said, I can I want to assume a buyback, but let's say it's not five percent. Let's say it's two percent. I can kind of see what how some of these things change, and if I'm being honest, I I do think that they can achieve uh, around twenty five or twenty percent growth rates going forward, and I can expect kind of like a recovery point uh, mm -hmm. over that time period. Again, now, though, do not. Do not copy this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I, yeah. if I accidentally just now sounded like I was hype, hyping this up. No, 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 no. Please. Yeah. Please do not. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just walking you through my thought process. So right here, I can see in 2021, that's what their estimated total sales were to be. And then estimated in 2019 is 200, uh, 249 million. So I can see that. that okay. So they're being expected already a 25% a rate of return or not rate of return, sorry, growth rate. So I'm kind of more confident in this model, not just because I'm saying it, because also like the analyst community is also kind of saying that, but I, I just use them as a, like a double check to see, oh, what's their opinion? Uh, so that's kind of what I'm, what I'm looking at here. So I think the odds more or less are in my favor. Again, it has to be speculative only because outside forces, it's not speculative because it could go bankrupt. I don't think that anymore. I don't think that's the risk anymore. The bankruptcy risk is kind of gone, especially after that sale. Again, going back here to the news. And that was on October 7th. So um, I do see I do see this not being a bankruptcy risk at the present moment. And I think they're, yeah, their short interest is still 11%, but that, that shouldn't be too big of a deal. That's not really a short squeeze play at all. Not at all. But uh, this is a company that, I mean, 
I kind of hope the Reddit crowd does not see this. Uh, not this video, but this company. They don't find this company just because, I don't know, it could be, I'm not even going to say it. I'm not even going to say it on this video. <laughs> yeah. I don't right. even want to, I don't even want to mess with that kind just of stuff. Don't but, copy this trade. It's yeah, the just only don't copy this trade. Out, out of this video. Terrible, terrible investment. Idea. This is a terrible, terrible investment idea. I'm, I'm a really stupid, stupid, dumb, dumb for buying this yes. stock. And but, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. Fabio, I kind of have a question now for, for someone who might be like an average retail investor kind of looking into this video now, and they might kind of dive into the financials of this company and just yeah. see like a, like a total mess. Are you basically in essence mess. by through, yeah. through your actions here, are you exemplifying sort of this idea that you should technically sometimes go against the crowd, go against the market sentiment to almost not, not that this is always a guarantee that there's deals in these certain things, but to sort of think unconventionally from conventional thinking when you're pursuing certain opportunities. Oh yeah. 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 So the, I'm, I'm trying to showcase the thought process. So mm -hmm. always go unconventional, not always, but <clears throat> don't be afraid to go unconventional and Perfect. you gotta be, yeah, you gotta be careful uh, when you gotta realize when you actually might be wrong. All right. So you want to always plan for that in, in your investment process. Uh, and you want to never, ever, ever surround yourself with yes, men. I think YouTube is becoming a yes, men. It is. Uh, place. It is. And people also attack you too. If you're the voice of reason saying no, yeah. which I find kind of surprising. Cause at least for me, whenever I'm potentially invest, like interested in investing into something, I like to kind of hear the arguments against my particular investment, because then it kind of offers me a new perspective I might not have considered. If I just sit in an echo chamber where everybody's telling me yes, and then I attack the people that say no, where will I really get in my learning process? Because, you know, Fabio, we learn by making mistakes. So, well, I mean, I'll put it this way. Uh, Maybe it's a maybe it's more or less a good thing that a lot of people are like that because then I, I the then the few can be very successful at investing and then the majority can not do well over time. So it's also uh, a good point. Yeah, so they're like your competitors out there. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a zero sum game by any means. Actually, there's technically uh, infinite value production capabilities in the world, but um, more or less, it, it it's fine. It just don't worry about what other people are really doing. If they want to be that way, that's fine. But I mean, we're not experiencing that really. I mean, with with some of our videos, there hasn't been a, a like overt what I wouldn't call it hate, but if there hasn't been overt uh, negative sentiment, yeah, negative sentiment. I've yeah. seen a lot of uh, comments so far that you know I've been like, oh, you know, they might disagree, but they bring up these points, and that's yeah. interesting. And some people just you know just say, oh, I disagree, and then well, they don't say it that way, but they just say I disagree, and they they don't say anything else beyond that, and that's okay too. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess those people are kind of just learning, and that's what I I can always expect. I mean, go go working in in this industry is kind of like it's understandable when when especially when someone says, uh, or they put a lot of their own money. And then they, they tie the investment with their emotions. And so yeah. by attacking, or they, they feel like you're attacking, you may not actually be attacking it. You might be saying like, oh, this is a good company, but these are some of the risks that you should think about. And if you even say that you're not buying this company, you're basically saying, uh, like, it, it, it's like someone treasuring something, right? An object. And then you're just saying, they think it's worth this. And you're just you know saying, oh, it's not worth that. It's worth this. By, by saying that you're not buying it. That's what you're saying. So they, they look at that and they, they take offense to it. They say, well, if you're not willing to buy it now, then you're saying it's not worth what I think it's worth. And therefore you're, you're offending me. So that's, that's unfortunate. That's, that's what the lack of a better term, that's what the noobs think. And then the noobs, the noobs. yeah, the noobs, <laughs> yeah, the noobs think. And, and um, I guess once, once they, once they get to the higher levels of investing and they, they become wealthy from investing, then they start to change that dynamic because then you start to say oh i don't care what what this person says in fact great tell me why i'm wrong like that's what i look for i say okay great tell me why i'm wrong uh um, yeah i want to know why i'm wrong because i don't want to lose money i don't care about <laughs> oh i'm right or i'm wrong i, I just want to really want to know when i'm wrong because that's the dangerous moments when, when i am mm -hmm. wrong so like uh for example, I mean, it, it, when we when I first pitched this company, ASPS, you rightly said, oh, it looks like garbage, you know, from a financials perspective. And I was yeah. like, oh, OK, well, I had I had stuff to back it up. Right. Yeah. So I, I sh you know, showcase that. Oh, I did the research. I, I know more or less the, the fundamentals of this business. I know that, OK, it looks bad, but it's because this, this and this. 
And then you were like, yeah. oh, okay. So then what you did for me is not only did you try to provide a counterpoints that were in essence valid, but you also solidified my arguments. You made me, you increased my confidence by not being a yes man. And that's what yeah. everyone out there, if you're, if you're investing, look for in your circle, non yes men, basically. You don't want mm -hmm. a yes man. You don't want to say, oh, they just look for you to tell them what to invest in. Like maybe you're the stock guy in your group of friends. And then all your friends just look for you to uh, tell them what to invest in. You, you definitely don't want that because then you just surrounded yourself with yes men. Instead, try yeah. to find another person that also likes investing and try to make sure that they're not just basically just always agreeing with your investments because that's definitely how you end up not being that successful because you're always yeah. going to make mistakes unless you are better than Warren Buffett. <laughs> well, gonna, I mean, also, also too, to kind of add on onto that point, if you surround yourself with only yes men, Fabio, then the likelihood of you mitigating those, those mistakes are decreased by a substantial amount. Whereas if you surround yourself with someone that's willing to kind of almost be like, Hey, wait a second. Why are you investing in this? Did you this think about like this? About to go. Yeah. Yeah. Did you think about this? Then that is already a hedge against the potential mistake you could be making in the future. Oh, yeah. And that just like you had just said, that really in, kind of increases your confidence kind of coming into these sorts of investments. And that's kind of really the fun part about investing too. And that's why, at least for me, I absolutely love to look for people that specifically disagree with me as well, because then that helps me solidify my own position. And also because you're just one person, you might have potentially overlooked a significant risk that someone else might bring to your attention that you'll only find if you don't constantly surround yourself with yes men with investing. Exactly. But with that being said, Fabio, do you have any closing thoughts before I end the show here today? So basically, again, closing thoughts, ASPS, why did I like it? Counter cyclical, uh, fundamentals look good going forward into the future starting January 2022. Uh, and then the third reason would be uh, the the uh, company that, or not the company, the hedge fund that gave them the line of credit, so eliminated bankruptcy risk. And then now the new fourth reason is they just sold a non-core asset for a significant sum of money and a huge gain from what they purchased it. So not only does it show me management's competent, but it also shows me that maybe they're right about what they're valuing their other assets at. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have to go back and now see, okay, what did they say that everything was valued at? Maybe they're they're being truthful, not, not that they would lie to me, but sometimes management can be over exuberant, but maybe they were right. And maybe I got to now remod or recalculate that in the model or recalculate that in my expectations and, and that the underlying value is what I actually have is a, is a gem. But unfortunately, it must remain for me, my rules, uh, speculative investment simply because the, um, it's, uh, some of the uh, factors are outside of their control. But mm -hmm. the way I look at it is if it does really well, while it's only, well, now it's at uh, almost 3% of my portfolio, uh, while it's, it's only that, it still can grow substantially based on my, my forecast for, for me personally. I don't even think I even went over the forecast, uh, but I, I don't think I should. No, <laughs> yeah. it's probably fine at this point. I don't point. think I should. <laughs> <laughs> You've made your point quite well, Fabio. Yeah. <laughs> so the way I look at it is it actually might become just by the, sh if everything plays out the way I think it will. Uh, it might still become a meaningful part of my portfolio and I still will make a, a significant sum of money uh, uh, and, and a percentage wise, it will, it will be good too. But, but in, in raw dollar terms, a significant amount of money that I won't complain about and my retirement will be uh, all the more, um, um, how do you say that? Swell. Yeah, swell. swell. Yeah, yes. Well, well so you have heard it here, folks. Um, this is the Capital Mindset Show. We're your hosts, Austin and Fabio. If you've liked what you've seen here today, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Please share our video. It really helps out our channel. And please visit our website at capitalmindset.org, and we'll see you guys again. Take care.